Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is How the World is Changing. It's an update on the orthodox view of the war with Rabbi Itchel Krasinjanski. Uh, welcome to the show, Rabbi. Thank you, Jay. Always a pleasure to be here. Well, let's talk about Chabad at first. You know, Chabad uh, was kind enough, generous enough um, to help uh, some of the families uh, in Israel come to the Washington rally last week. Can you talk about that? Yes. So, yeah, Chabad in Israel, which is, uh, Chabad is a very large presence in Israel. There's even a whole village called Kfar Chabad, the village of Chabad. that was established uh, shortly after the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, but Chabad has chapters and centers and synagogues all throughout the country. And Chabad also, unfortunately, um, has a um, whole staff that deals with uh, terror victims and uh, throughout all the wars and their families and it helps them, you know, pick up the pieces and helps them in a myriad of ways. So now, just last week, uh, Chabad arranged for the families of the hostages who are in Gaza, 240 hostages or so. So there was about a couple hundred people that were flown in uh, from Israel to participate in the rally that took place last week in Washington, D.C. Uh, more than just the rally, they arranged for them to meet with congressmen and senators and and politicians, and, you know, who are in Washington. and. Uh, to plead their case and to make uh, them aware of their plight, the plight of their of their loved ones, uh, and before they actually they actually flew into JFK to New York, uh, and they went first for like a spiritual pilgrimage to the holy resting place of Rabbi Schneerson, who is the Chabad rabbi, who's the tower who was passed away a little over uh, 20 years ago, and he was like a towering spiritual figure, and people come to his resting place from all over the world and pray, and um, they were there. And mm -hmm. uh, I was in New York last week myself. I did not go to the rally. I flew back that day, but Pearl actually did go to the rally, and she can tell us about it if she shows up soon. Uh, but I was there when they uh, when when they pulled up to the Rebbe's uh, graveside, the holy place, a couple of chartered buses, and there were lots and lots of people. The word got out that they were coming, and there were lots of people there uh, welcoming them very, very warmly and singing and embracing them and basically um, doing what uh, we can to uh, ease their unbelievable suffering or yeah. hard to imagine suffering. A lot of people in the community uh, feel that the hostages are, um, should, that that the war has to be won before the hostages will be released. But Hamas is playing with us and all these, quote, negotiations aren't going to go anywhere. And, um, you know, this is a problem because if you approach Joe Biden and say, do something to release the hostages, uh, there may be really nothing that he can do. Now, in the paper this morning, um, there was a report that both Hamas and the Israelis felt that we were closer to a release of some hostages. I don't know what the sticking points are. They've been sticking points for weeks. Um, but my question to you is, um, you know, that Hamas is terrorists. Hamas is playing the hostages. Um, they they took the hostages for strategical reasons and psychological reasons. Uh, can we ever get them out uh, without conceding way too much? In the past, when this has happened, Israel has conceded things, and I'm not sure that they're going to be able to cut a deal. What do you think? I don't know. To be honest with you, this is a very, very, very complicated situation. If Israel didn't care. Uh, for each individual uh, person that's hostage, it's 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 almost like natural, and it's within the teachings of Judaism, and it's part of our DNA to care for each other. So therefore, Israel 
is pretty much um, <clears throat> has no choice but has to figure out ways to uh, save the hostages. Um, and that has to be balanced against the, like you mentioned, the absolute imperative need to wipe out the terrorists, to wipe out Hamas once and for all, as the, as the West did to the Nazis during World War II. So it's almost like an impossible, uh, you know, to how to strike a balance. Uh, Israel is trying its best. And, uh, with God's help, they will be able to bring the hostages back home and finish the job, uh, which they absolutely must. So um, I don't envy uh, the, uh, the, 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 the leaders in Israel in figuring out um, you know, how, how, how to maneuver. It is a very, um, you know, it, it gets my blood boiling <clears throat> as if to, uh, you know, when, when, like you say, they're playing with us, uh, the Hamas, and they're like almost like dictating, uh, like they're like an equal uh, member uh, at the table dictating, you know, how it's going to come down and what they're willing to agree to and whatnot. That must be very, very difficult as well. But um, like I say, uh, Israel is, um, you know, it, it's absolute commitment to every single, uh, to every single uh, hostage is, um, I guess, overrides, overrides, you know, what they would normally know what to do. Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, the Orthodox and uh, the ultra-Orthodox uh, in Israel, the Haredi. <clears throat> you know, how, how has their view changed? Because before, um, they were not interested in serving in the army. <clears throat> um, they were not necessarily in agreement, um, you know, with, uh, the, uh, with the, the war. Um, how, how are they feeling now? How has it changed for them and for Chabad, for that matter? Okay, good question. Um, so first of all, uh, just for your audience to know that Chabad, even though we are quote-unquote orthodox, uh, we're referred to as orthodox within the, the, within the streams of Judaism, orthodox, conservative, and reform, because we uh, embrace the Torah and the commandments. Uh, nevertheless, um, Chabad is not seen as Haredi in the Israeli society. Because we are um, much more um, maybe open-minded is the right word. I'm not sure, but we are more um, integrated with uh, the whole of Israeli society, religious and non-religious, right and left. That was one of the revolutionary um, approaches and philosophy of Rabbi Schneerson is to. Um, reach out to all Jews and not segregate uh, ourselves from the, the, the larger Jewish community. So from the beginning of, from the beginning of statehood of, of, uh, of the state of Israel, uh, which was founded as a secular state, um, Ben Gurion, who was the first uh, prime minister in Israel, recognized uh, the need to preserve uh, you know, the, the classical observance stream of, of, of Judaism. So he made accommodations uh, for them. And one of them was that they were exempt from serving in the army as long as they were studying in the, you know, in the academies, in the yeshivas. And that's been going on for since the statehood. However, over the years, uh, it became a contentious political issue. A lot of the uh, non-Haredi community felt that um, that the, Har the Haredim uh, were taking a pass and not doing their share in protecting the nation like everyone else. So there was a lot of tension and schism within the community. In the last many years, or in the last several years, there's been a push on the part of the Israeli government and within also the Israeli society to uh, somehow come, come closer together, 
the Haredi community and the general community. And in reference to what we're talking about is for them to begin to serve in the army. So while there isn't the draft and the quotas, um, there isn't the draft, there's still the exemption that applies to Haredi. But today, most, most ultra-religious Jews do join the army. Chabad forever has joined the army. The young Chabad uh, Hasidim who are living in Israel, they joined the army. But now, now it's been more, more and more of the Haredim. And something amazing has been happening in Israel uh, since the war started. And that is that Israel, unfortunately, or maybe just the way we are wired, we meaning the Jewish people, uh, there's been a, uh, there's been a, great divisions within within the society. You don't need to look beyond the fact that in America, we're, we're a population of several hundred million people, we basically have two political parties, primarily two political parties. In Israel, with 8 million citizens, you have 20 political parties or more. <laughs> That's who make up the government, the Knesset. Um, so there's been a lot of, you know, tension between the secular and the religious, the left and the right. And in Israel, where it's not abstract, the ideas and the and the policies are not abstract, but they actually affect the people in a very real way. You know, whether to give, whether, whether to negotiate with the Palestinians, whether to create a Palestinian state, these have, uh, th- th- these impact the lives of the people. There's everybody in Israel is involved in politics. Everyone has an opinion. And very often there, it was a divisive uh, situation. But now uh, everyone is coming together in unbelievable ways. We have to hope and pray that it continues. But today there's no right and left in Israel. There's no division. Everyone is united together and feels like one big family. Uh, with, with The first goal is to um, bring the hostages back. Second goal is to uh, annihilate Hamas, who are um, until today, you know, they, they don't they're not backing down from their uh, mission just to destroy the Jewish people. What's interesting is we, the Jewish people, sadly, unfortunately, uh, have a long history of uh, people trying to annihilate us, going all the way back to Egypt. When we first uh, were born as a nation, that they enslaved the Jewish people. And we all know the story, the biblical story, where God brought the 10 plagues on the Egyptians. And eventually they, uh, they, they, you know, they, um, they surrendered and they said, go, let my people go. And they let the Jewish people go because they saw that they couldn't stand up against God Almighty and they were being destroyed. But these terrorists, know they're being destroyed. They don't care. They don't mind. They don't mind that they bring destruction also on the Palestinian people who are not Hamas. Uh, and um, and uh, but they're just sworn to destroy the Jewish people. So it's a much more it's a much more difficult enemy to fight because they they don't fear death. And they don't care about uh, inflicting death not only on the Jewish people but even on the Palestinians. So it's a very mm-hmm. difficult situation. Yeah, so the uh, Chabad and the Haredi uh, are together uh, on the notion that they must be destroyed. There's no difference of opinion on that. Hmm? I I don't believe so, and I don't think it's just Chabad and the Haredi. I think even the right and the left Hmm. today all all agree and acknowledge that uh, Israel has to destroy Hamas, because every time in the past when Israel was close, it's a total victory. Always politically, something uh, something cropped up that you know that brought about a ceasefire and a this and a that, and it never was able to ultimately uh, totally destroy uh, the enemy like 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 the Allies destroyed the Nazis. It didn't you know they they didn't make a ceasefire until they destroyed them and they surrendered. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, troubled by all this talk about ceasefire and pause and bigger ceasefire and little ceasefire, ceasefire part of a, a release of a hostages deal because I I think it allows Hamas to regroup, but I I think it's also a, 
a message. It's like capitulation, and and we'll have more of that kind of play going forward um, with the other hostages. Uh, Correct. You know, I'm troubled that that Joe Biden is under such political pressure um, that he has to pressure Israel to do um, ceasefires and pauses and the like. Uh, how do you feel? How how what, well, how do well, people in Israel feel about that? Well, um, I can tell you how I feel and how many, many Jewish people feel, uh, probably in Israel as well. But it's really, um, it's part of how Jews are treated differently than anyone else. When uh, former President Bush uh, went after ISIS uh, or, or, uh, or in Iraq, no one... No one said after two weeks that we need to have a ceasefire and we have to uh, give them, a, you know, pause, you know, so they can catch their breath and regroup. You know, uh, the president at the time pushed, you know, the pushed the 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 war effort until we destroyed ISIS, so we brought down Saddam Hussein. So why, when it comes to Israel, all of a sudden? You know, the talk of a ceasefire and humanitarian pause. Yeah, it's, it's really, I mean, unfortunately, there's a double standard when it comes to the Jewish people. And uh, that's something that um, has been around for a long time, probably from the beginning of time. But when, it, when you see it in real time, it's very, very disheartening and even very, very frightening, especially uh, the, the call. Uh, you know, the call and the pressure on Israel to stop because of, of of the casualties of war, a war that Israel didn't initiate, didn't ask for, but a war that Israel has to fight to to protect its, its citizens. And um, yes, that's why war is a terrible thing. No one wants, no civilized nation wants war. But at the same time, it has a sacred obligation to protect itself and its citizens. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the, one of the uh, interesting things this has revealed is that the liberal press has followed this kind of ultra liberalism um, to um, you know support the, the Palestinians even at the expense of Israel. So if you look at um, you know um, cable news that has previously been you know, dedicated to um, liberal causes in the country, in this country. Now you find when they report on Israel that the first thing they do is they they talk about, um, you know, the plight of the Palestinians, and they seem to forget uh, to cover the plight of the hostages and the people who were killed on October 7th, murdered on October 7th. And I, I find it very interesting that... Um, you know, when, when Hamas comes up with a number, and I was just watching last night, Hamas comes up with a number, they say, oh, um, 11,000 uh, Palestinians have been killed. And some of them condition it, but others do not condition it. They take it as fact. And then when the Israelis uh, go into the tunnels un under that um, hospital, hospital. Um, they say, uh, we have no way of actually uh, uh, verifying what the Israelis are saying. And the implication is that we don't necessarily believe them. And I find that extraordinary because to me, the Israelis are trying hard to tell the truth on everything. And Hamas is trying to lie on everything. And yet, these, um, these news uh, shows and channels and broadcasts seem to give um, the edge to anything reported by Hamas. And, and that's what's uh, inflamed the Middle East. That's what's inflamed the college campuses. How do you feel about the way the media has been handling this, uh, the Western media, if you will? Well, I agree with everything you say, and it's very, very, um, it's very upsetting. <clears throat> it, it, to me, it's just like good old anti-Semitism when it doesn't, even when it reports, it reports as if there's, a, a, a battle between two legitimate, uh, you know, two legitimate peoples, and um, and then you know talking about the casualties, and like you say, most of the time the focus is on the casualties happening uh, in Gaza, not the murder 
of the innocent people in Israel, not about the hostages. It's really, really, um, it's shocking, shocking as if, you know, as if Israel just decided to go in and to uh, bomb uh, Gaza unprovoked. They don't yeah. even, uh, you know, and sometimes, you know, e- even if they do mention it, it's like a cursory mention, and then they just go on to talk about the, the casualties. And they don't even talk about the fact that um, that Israel goes to such great lengths to try to avoid uh, innocent, uh, or quote-unquote, I'm quoting them, the civilian population, from killing the civilian population. But, uh, you know, the, the terrorists, they embed themselves in the, in, the, in the residential communities and where they live and the hospitals and kindergartens and all of these, as we all know. And it's as if nobody says boo. And Israel's to blame. Yeah, this is a real problem. I mean, uh, uh, <clears throat> some of my favorite uh, radio and uh, television uh, stations have been doing that, one-sided reporting. And uh, it's it's very troubling, and I and I will never forget that they did this. I'm I'm um, now I question everything they say, not just about Israel. The other thing is uh, funny that uh, Fox News, which I used to think was a um, you know right wing Trump type organization, at least on the subject of Israel, is doing a better job. Uh, it, it's really a it's really 180 different. And finally, YouTube. YouTube has uh, increasingly a number of YouTube videos up there um, about what happens on the battlefield, about uh, the hostages, the families, um, about you know the motivations of of the uh, of the Israelis, um, and and it's better reporting. And you can go on YouTube, and you can um, you know say that. You want to see that, and you can be better informed on YouTube. Mm. Uh, so uh, that's how I get my news these days because I have learned not to trust um, the uh, news organizations I used to trust, um, and I and I, and I wonder if people are getting that. And it takes me to my next question to you: We have seen this extraordinary and blatantly ignorant uh, phenomenon in the United States, uh, where people. Including college kids and university students and what have you are um, protesting against Israel for Hamas, uh, and uh, they are, uh, you know, they're they're kind of supporting uh, what Hamas did, and this is happening on many an increasing number of campuses by an increasing number of students. Um, And the administrators and officers of these universities seem to go along with it or allow it to happen. Uh, My view, as as Ben Shapiro's view, a spokesman for the Israeli point of view, an American, um, if a a teacher, I've said this before, if a a teacher or administrator of one of these colleges uh, supports Hamas or doesn't stop uh, uh, groups that do support Hamas, he should lose his job. It's that simple. Goodbye. Um, but that's not happening. Uh, so, Rabbi, I'd like to know your view and the view of Chabad and the you know the Jewish community, including the Orthodox community, about what is happening on these college campuses and where it is all going in terms of public opinion in this country. Um, yeah, again, I agree with everything you're saying. It's very, very, very frightening. Uh, was happening on the campuses. Um, just uh, just this past Sunday, there was a rally in Waikiki, uh, a pro-Palestinian rally, and uh, some members of the Jewish community showed up to uh, counter it. Uh, I was there as well, and we were outnumbered, uh, maybe five to one, uh, by the people who came out uh, were pro Hamas. Uh, a lot of them are American, and a lot of young people, and uh, and the the um, the the tone and the anger and the the shouting was very 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 frightening. I don't think a lot of them really know 
what Hamas is all about and their atrocities, or they don't want to believe it, or they just don't care. But, um, you know, as Jews, unfortunately, we have a long history of anti-Semitism. The fact that it's rearing its head in America today, in the, uh, you know, to the extent that it is, is very, very frightening. And like you say, the administrators and the professors and even anyone that could support Hamas today is really, um, is really, uh, they're like enablers because by, by not denouncing, you know, this kind of evil, this kind of barbarism, um, it always, it gives them support, gives them moral support. And um, and moral support translates into into more beheadings and more rapes and more killings. Yeah. So um, it's really extraordinary that anybody in the world considers themselves civilized um, could support Hamas and what Hamas has done and has said it will do. Uh, you know, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, it's it's out it's outrageous. United Nations is not doing anything. Um, and the U.S. is, uh, you know, it's helpful in its own way. But frankly, uh, this war is getting worse. As as uh, Ben Shapiro said, uh, he doesn't sleep well at night worrying about it. And I can tell you that a lot of people don't sleep well at night worrying about, worrying about the existence of the state of Israel, worrying about a war that seems to be growing in its uh, scope and it, it participants against Israel. And so I guess my question to you is how, how do you cope with that? How do you cope with it? And how should Jews everywhere cope with it, with this uh, emergence of a, a new and virulent kind of anti-Semitism, a violent anti-Semitism, an anti-Semitism that doesn't go away? While the Israelis are trying to you know, save the hostages, Hamas is still shooting at them, still firing rockets um, into uh, you know, Israel, and it's not only Hamas now, it's the it's the West Bank, and it's uh, Lebanon, and it's uh, Yemen. Uh, it's a multi-front war. It's enough to lose a little sleep over, maybe a lot of sleep. Your thoughts, your advice? Well, first of all, unfortunately, and I don't know the exact, uh, maybe that requires another show, to try to understand why the left is so anti-Semitic. Uh, the, the people who are on the right politically, for the most part, are not anti-Semitic. They're supporting, they're support, they're supportive of Israel, supportive of what Israel is trying to do. It is the left that's um, that's egging on this fight and and supporting the Hamas. So, why is that? As a rabbi, I just want to say that. Um, Throughout our history, really, how Jews cope with this and how Jews cope with anti-Semitism is through uh, intensifying our faith in God, our connection to God, and our strengthening our uh, ourselves spiritually. The spiritual dimension uh, has a very, very strong uh, impact on uh, on everything on all the other dimensions of life there's something very very interesting and that is uh, in the very beginning of the bible it talks about abraham first jew and he traveled through ancient israel the land of canaan and his wife was hijacked taken as a as a captive by the king and then later on um, when the king, when Abraham speaks to the king and the king returns Sarah back to him, his wife, um, the king says, why did you say she was your sister? And therefore we took her, but she was a, a pretty woman. Why didn't you tell us that she was your wife? So Abraham said to the king, it's because I saw there was no fear of God in this place. And I was afraid that you were going to kill me. I was to tell you that uh, she's my wife, 
it would kill me so she would no longer be a wife of, of, of a person. So Abraham was able to connect the dots between lack of faith and murder. It's not, it's not so it's not so apparent that just because there's a breakdown in our faith in a higher power, a breakdown in our faith in right and wrong and the absolute morals that the Bible teaches us, that there's a direct link with that breakdown to the actual violence that could ensue. But we're seeing it today. We're seeing it today. And unfortunately, um, you know, unfortunately, I think that if we are able to strengthen ourselves, first ourselves within every single person individually and collectively as a society, and go back to the to the values of of the Torah of the Bible, where there is right and there is wrong. It's not it's not relative. It's, there's absolute right and wrong, and there's a higher authority, a higher power. Remember, many many years ago. When in the public schools, they uh, banned uh, prayer in public schools. The Rebbe came out, the Rebbe said that um, that would have a, a direct effect on the behavior of these students later on in, in their lives. Because if you don't, if you're not re reared and raised with an awareness of, of a higher power that's looking over you and, 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 and right and wrong, then the consequences are 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 inevitably to follow, and this was at a time when there was no shooting in schools. It was mm -hmm. unheard of mm -hmm. in the in the nineteen seventies. That uh, you know, we could only go back to that time. <laughs> I don't mean going back to the seventy three war, but going back to that time. So, um, what about uh, action points? Uh, you know, for example. Um, it seems to me that uh, Israel ha has uh, three, four hundred thousand of its uh, reservists on the, on the battle, um, and they have jobs, a lot of them. And, the, uh, and, and that's got to affect the economy, that they're out of work all this time. And uh, th those communities uh, near the border, especially near the border of Lebanon, uh, they've, been, they've been abandoned. The, the, the uh, IDF has asked people to move south to avoid the violence. And so what you have is um, things that will affect the Israeli economy. And so American Jews, um, do you think American Jews have a duty to support, financially support Israel? And if so, how? Um, and furthermore, let me add another thing is, uh, you know, there are a lot of Americans, not only Jews, but Americans who have gone to Israel over the past few weeks and joined the IDF. Good for them. Just as a lot of Americans went to Ukraine and joined the, you know, Ukraine army, um, people with conscience uh, and who are willing to put their life on the line. Um, what about that as an action point? Those two things. Could you comment? Yeah. So I think the, I think it's wonderful. Uh, these people uh, uh, are doing unbelievable things, and. And actually, that's the flip side of, of this horror of the war, that we see so many people are coming forward and, like you say, are putting their lives on the line and going above and beyond to do everything that they can to help uh, Israel in, the, in this war. And, um, I mean... Uh, so many examples, so many examples of big and small in big and small ways where people are at the very beginning of the war. Someone, uh, I saw a clip where a big, big um, shopping, uh, a big store in a shopping center, a big kosher store was empty. Uh, all the shelves were empty because people were coming in with duffel bags and buying everything that they can and sending it to Israel so they'll have. It. And, and um, even from our community here, some people actually uh, flew to Israel. Uh, some Israelis who were living here flew to join the, uh, you know, to join the front lines and the front lines. Some just there to, to be there. There's, there's a fellow who comes here. Uh, he's an Israeli. He lives here. Um, and, um, he lives part-time in Israel. He has an apartment 
in Netanya in Israel. And uh, he got in touch with uh, an organization in Israel that helps the people from uh, the south to f- find places to live because they, they, you know, they, they, their kibbutzim were burnt down and shut up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So he gave up. So he uh, opened up the doors of his house, of his apartment, to this family from the south. He was telling me, uh, you know, he spoke to them. It's 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 a a mother and three children. Her husband was killed on October seventh. No, her son. She, one of her sons were was shot and killed on October seventh, and then the terrorists pulled out a grenade and was going to throw it in the apartment. So the husband jumped on the grenade and got killed, but and, but he saved the rest of his family, and but one of her sons. You know, there's shrapnel in him, and he lost one of his eyes. So that's the family that's living in his apartment. And and, and this is happening again and again and again and again. So um, that's, like I say, that's very, very uh, amazing. The, the good that's coming, that, that's coming out of this from good, good, good people. Uh, we need to actually... Um, we need to actually build on it and uh, and make it grow because this is a classical uh, war between good and evil, darkness and light. And ultimately, what we know from what Judaism teaches us that that uh, that good will vanquish evil. We believe that, and light dispels darkness. And everyone in their own personal lives has to um, think how they can become more of a light uh, in 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 one's own small uh, footprint. And collectively, this is um, how we're going to win this war. Yeah, and also the media, and also talking on the media, and um, you know, covering these issues and these events. And that's why I. Greatly appreciate you coming on our shows to discuss it, and I, I would like to circle back with you in the near term, uh, so we can continue sure. to follow it, what's going on, and and the changes, and what it means, what it means to the the Israelis, what it means to the Jews, what it means to the United States, what it means to the world. It has global impact, and we need to, you know, we need to watch that and cover that, and discuss and analyze that. So I'll be I'll Thank be on you. I'll be on I'll be back to you, Rabbi. Thank we'll talk you. some more. Thank you very very Thank much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for inviting me. Be well. Absolutely. Aloha.